My name is Luke Townsend. I work for the Library and Information Service of the City of Cape Town. And I'm here in the American corner at the Central Library Cape Town with reggae musician and bass player Wakile Kalisa. He's a renowned bass player in the genre of reggae, but in other genres as well. And we're just go conducting an oral history uh, interview about his experience in the music industry and as a musician in Cape Town and the world. So, Wakile, what is your full name and when and where were you born? Okay, I was born in 1969. My name is Wakile Kalisa, and then I was born in, in Cape Town in, in the townships of Kol Nyanga. That's where I grow up. I do most of my experience in life and getting into music. That was in Nyanga. Of course, now we have a lot of big name around the world of being a bad township, but in Yanga also there was so much music. I experienced so much music, people who love music. So it was a, a balanced way of growing. And music took me more than soccer, whatever was happening around. There was so much, but my father played, he's still playing the guitar, a quella, he was a quella. They had a band was called Quella Kids in the 60s. It's Jack, Jack Kalisa. So he played pen whistle, he played a, a guitar also. And my grandmother apparently she played also the, the birimbao, they used to call it in those time in Tosa, the Wadi. Oh, yeah, in yeah, Tosa. Yeah, they used to, yeah. yeah, that's yeah. The, the name. But I haven't got to see her, but I heard she was a musician too. Please describe the community that you grew up in? Well, my community side, the background was a bit rough to survive also growing up in a township because there was so much gangsterism, there was so much other things that they can distract you as a youth. But I'm happy that I managed to survive without being a gangster or somebody, yeah, but yeah. through the music, I loved the music, so music totally me put me in a safe and a good direction. How would you describe yourself? Well, I see myself as a musician and also I try, of course, my background, I played a lot of reggae in, in my growing. The music I played a lot was reggae. Most people know me as a bass player who play reggae bass. And my first international artist I worked with was bought, brought here by the British Council a guy was called Benjamin Zephaniah, a dub poetry. Yeah. This is my first international with my band. That time we were call ourselves Reggae Regulars. Is the first international artist that I really played the dub style because England was a different style compared to Jamaica. Though it was Jamaica, but them yeah. have a totally different style, the dub thing. So from that time, I think things started to, to come up. My first going out. It was with a, the, the dance group, was called Pace Dance. So it was mixed with, a, you know, black and white, and we do different things. I was with Holewa. If you remember uh, Holewa yeah, Masala, yeah. Mike Makubela. So the guy, they brought me up. And for me, the music they played, it was different from reggae now. It was like Afro, African. So it was new for me. But my interest was in. It was to learn also different styles, not to be a certain bass player. So from that time, we went up to, to, to France. We did England. I mean, tour with the dance, and we play in between the, 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 the set and play for some dance room. From there, things started because we were in England. If you remember, uh, Nadia and Pete. Yes. Enjoy. In go yeah, that's where we go to meet them in England. It was in the early 90s. So we met up with Pete today, Nadia. There was a guy, he came from Germany, this guy. I mean, he became, yeah, yeah. later, he became a management of us. This guy, we met him in England, and he had an interest because it was me and Mike and Morris, the, the drummer from Mozambique, used to play for he, Pongolo. If you remember, the group was called Pongolo. Elito, Matsola, Jito Baloi, all those guys. So this guy used to play drums with the band. So it was me now and him and Mike. They, 
German guys start to get interested to say, okay, it's still a small tree, or it would be good to, to work. Say, say, okay, you guys, I want you guys to come to Germany. We start to do a, a, a record label. Yeah. Started to call African Dance record label, something like that. So we work with this guy. I think after the wall came down, when I, I started to get into Berlin. So it was a, a, a good journey for me coming from the township and the culture that changed because Europe was different for me, you know, yeah. and, and the South African. So it was fine, like it was punk, it was everything hardcore. So yeah, for me also, that was a good learning curve to start to respect people as they are, not judging them. People was people. It's just the way they look, they gave you a certain image, but I find that this was people. Yeah. I could live with them. Because when I lived there, I lived in the east side, and it was in a squatter area. In, so in, in, you in can Berlin. In Berlin. <laughs> so you can imagine, it was like a, you know, a mixture of people. Yeah, so for me, look, I learned a lot, but I was still not really growing in music because we were almost doing the same thing, yeah. not interacting with different people who have this thing. The guy was paying the band, working or not working, but setting up tours around Europe. And yeah, that moment was a good moment, but in terms of developing my bass playing, it was not really as the way I find myself now as a bass player, that I learned a lot of develop and then uh, Getting to West Africa bass playing is totally different than what we play in South Africa. Of the same chord progression we do, they do it different compared as the bass player, but it's almost the music is the same. But just the way of bass interpreting and how they play the bass, for me, was a big school to yeah. start to get to, to know this in Europe. Because also in South Africa, we didn't have so much African music when we talk the truth. Yeah, even yeah. now we no, still sure. don't from really the rest, have from the rest of Africa. We don't have. Yeah, no. For me, Europe was like an eye opener in music and also getting interest to to learn different things. Yeah, Europe it was like a a big explosion <laughs> in yeah. terms of my base. I mean, Ghana guys, guys from Togo, Cameroon, Burkina Faso, all different. Yeah, it was a big. It was a big challenge but it was a good opener and also be open in music yeah. so i learned a lot of things when did you uh, meet benjamin Zephaniah? this was a, almost a 80s when benjamin mid Zephaniah, yeah mid 80s when benjamin they brought him by the british council so then you went to europe in late 80s late 80s you came back here after europe what what I think it's almost after close to 2010 or something. On a, on, a, on, a, on a, the, the soccer, what was it? The, 2010? Yeah, this, I used to come in and go out. Oh, I yeah, see. So you were, there, you were yeah, between, yeah. between Europe and... Yeah, and between here. Europe, yeah. Wow. What attracted you to, to being a musician? Well, what attracted to me, besides that the music was at home, for me, it was a way out of South Africa in that moment because the apartheid time was a hard thing. Yeah. So for me, I saw music as a way out. If I play music, I would be able to go out again, be, you know, to... Because also before I left, my growing also could almost go, went a different direction. Because, you know, coming from the township, there was people recruiting. You either go to exile, you either be, come, you know. So I had a lot of these things as, in my growing, but I think I choose music because it was more love. I didn't yeah. want it to, to be like a samba to carry gun. Yeah, for yeah. me, I, I felt music would bring a big change, yeah. you know, by bringing peace, but also have a peace of mind. So for me, I felt music was the way to go. Yeah. Were you a Rastafarian by, by this time? No, that time I was not a Rastafarian, but my cousins I lived with, they were Rastafarian, but also because it's good to bring the Rasta, because Rasta also is one part that saved my lifestyle in a township. Yeah. Because Rasta came with a different way in terms of no violence, no stealing, don't be bad. And for me, that kept me 
of different things because we had two different things in the township. Either be 26 or 28 or all of this gang. A lot of us fall on this in our growing. There was two ways. It was soccer, there was the gang, there was different, it was music. So music took me more. I played soccer, my, but I, I didn't see a way out more than the music. So were you a musician before you were a Rastafarian? No, I was not a musician. That time before I was a Rastafarian, but music was a house. My big brother was a guitar player and there was an art center in front of my house. This was a art, sculpture and music. We have Makom Kubata, we saw Spen Zambatu. These are the people also made us to love music. Yeah. Because they were right in front of my house. It was just a, a minute for me to go and listen when they rehearse. You know, all the old guys, uh, uh, Victor Andoni, all of them, they used to come there. So music, for me, it was that long time because there was art school in front of me, the younger art center. So could you go to the school and learn bass? I didn't go, I learned by looking. I used to go and look when the guy, bass player, play. And then when they take a break for cigarettes, sometimes he used to tell me if you want to touch. This guy used to play with a... Uh, if you know Chris Siren, yeah, the band they used to have in, in a township called Non Oh yeah, the yeah. bass player used to play with him. Skuri, I forget the exactly the name, but he's the guy also because he saw the interest I have. But I didn't have a bass that time. I used to go and watch them when they rehearse them. They when they take a break or they send us for some cigarette, he say, okay, you can touch. You can play around. So yeah. I didn't have, I mean, I couldn't manage to, to, to have my own bass that time. But then I started to fall in love with the bass. Then the problem was this now. My parents couldn't buy me a bass. What I did when I started to have really this big interest, I went to work for the paper, the Cape Times, to buy my first bass. Wow. And that first bass was there, the guy. In, 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 it was called George Cooper Music. Yeah, yeah. You know this guy. Yeah. Yeah, this was the only shop. At that time, the bass I could afford, but I mean, also, it was just to have a bass. It's a bass was called Fame. The cheapest bass I could get it was called 800 or something like that. This bass I bought, and I told the guys when I was working on the Cape Town that I would work only to buy this bass, and then I'm finished with this shit. They were like, you're joking, you know, I fall with the champion. We all fall in that. Cape Times, you know, if you leave the school early, your way to buy your own things is to sell the papers yeah. in the morning. Oh, is that what you were doing for a, for a living? To, to buy my face base. Wow. A lot of people don't believe that I come from there. And those who know me, and I told them that for me, this I'm doing, I will buy my face base. After that, I leave this job. Yeah. It's not for me. Because my parents couldn't afford to buy. You also had to get an amplifier, or yes. you, th that came much later? No, that came much later, but to have an electric bass where you can play somewhere that's amplified, like the bass, we used to go there, you know, we used to play this reggae night, we used, I started to play there. With, was that reggae regulars? The reggae regulars. Because I saw you. Yeah, yeah. the reggae regulars. Before the sons, also I played with the sons of Silas yeah. afterwards, but my first thing was the reggae regulars, which is, that's where I started to develop a love of reggae music and the bass also. Because in those times, the 80s, 70s, I used to go to the sound system. It used to happen in, in a township, in different houses. Like yeah. we played the whole night, but on a tent. You know, the whole, for me, I used to sleep next to the speakers, just to hear the bass grow <laughs> from the time of Robbie Shakespeare. You remember Robbie Shakespeare, Flabber Hall, those bass players. It's so fun when I meet them also, they always have an interest inside. The way you play reggae, you have an old school technique yeah. of playing the reggae. How you get this? I say I listen to you guys from when I was young just to get this reggae yeah. authentic bass. Yeah, so it's it's like a, a long story. Then coming to the city, we had Ruby and the Dads, we had the bass, we had guys like Tim Power, we had different people, Nadia, and the, the, the music was so amazing that I had to develop to play different style because in Ops now it was a different style, it was a rock reggae, there was different thing, there was a... So in my now coming mixing in town, the bass start to change a little bit also to learn different style 
and get to play with different people. It was amazing. Reggae, it brought a lot of different people together. Yeah. Also, in yeah. terms of reggae music. Not that other music did not do, but reggae, it was like, like a free kind of everybody be who they are yeah. without no Except feeling, you know. Of yeah, so reggae music also was amazing around the world that you meet a lot of different people, but with reggae, we all become one people. How did your career change over the course of your life? And then also, was that change influenced by historical events? Yeah, a lot of change that happened that really came from the historical events. And the, the, for me, traveling outside of South Africa, also that also really opened me and also look at the music as a good profession and want to be a professional, there's a certain way that you have to present yourself also. So for me, really it changed a lot, look. Like for instance, now we have a management, he's a Frenchman, it's different people than being in South Africa, having a management working, you know, for you, yeah, it's totally different service and a different how people believe in you. For me, these are the big things that I start to experience that as a musician, it's not like you have to behave as a beggar. Yeah. Somehow yeah. people should respect you as, as you are and give you that big respect. Doesn't matter how big you are or small, but if they give that respect, they give you a good platform. Yeah. It's, it's the best way that we need as musicians also. How did South African history, did that influence your life and your music career? Well, when Mandela gets released, I remember it was just across here. You were here, across here. Look, that time, it was the biggest moment, not only for me, for a lot of people, because we thought things would just turn around. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. But, well, a lot of us got hope, a lot of us got disappointment in that time. Yeah. Because things didn't go the way we thought things was going to go. We're still living in a township, we're still having yeah. the same. Nothing really became to show us that we are free. We're still living in the same pressure. It's been released a little bit, but the pressure is still is there. And even now, I can see the township, a lot of people, there's no hope yeah. in everybody. Yeah. You know, because the life never changed for anybody. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. the tough times. Do you feel that the music industry or, the, or musicians are more alienated than they have, that they were before, before 94? Well, if I, I talk about my father's time, is different to us now as musician. It's my father's time to be them to be a musician. It was like almost nothing. They couldn't get anywhere. They couldn't get the chances that we had. We having now to go out and yeah. you know and express and everything. So somehow it is better in a way. But I feel still musicians need to be looked after more than they do in terms of arts and culture, talking about sport, but people, they put in sport more than the music. Yeah. I think music is a little bit, like yesterday, for example, there was a minister of arts and culture, and Tim Tetua, in Nyanga, at Center. Now they want to revive this place again, because somehow some Norwegian people gave them a little bit, but still we don't have a building. It was like containers and everything. But before, in my time, Art Center was a big thing was not big, but it was a proper place, yeah. you know, and things like that. And also, musicians, when Natim Tetra came into the Nyang Art Center, everybody thought maybe the musician will benefit or something, there will be something for the music. But basically, they will benefit, but in a way, that happens with art centers in a township also, look, people, they should look. It's not that this thing is just the art, Sometimes it becomes like a, a community thing. It's not just the art center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I know when I go to the, you know, there's a place it's called the Cafe de la Music, like what? They set up, they look, they have a, a venue that they, every year they have musicians, different big music coming. They have a, a hotel, they have rehearsal room for musicians. You don't pay 
We don't have so this where, facility where that, in Reunion Island. Reunion, okay. We don't have yeah. this. So we're having this big problem also in South Africa in terms of what musicians really deserve. We still deserve a lot. We haven't been looked after. Who is the person that has had the biggest influence on you becoming a musician or being a musician? There was a bass player called Gary King. Gary King used to play with a watch the groove watching down. Yeah. Gary King, I remember. Gary King was the, the guy, guy. of this guy. This guy because my father was playing a lot of jazz at home. So I grew up listening to a lot of Eric Gale, you know the different album, but it was more on the jazz. Heavy and Cox, those days. Yeah, my father was very musical. Every every end of the month or week he buys the LP. So we grew up listening to mostly jazz at home. This is another thing also. We listen radio, some rock music, but we were more on a jazz, guitarist, my father, John Benson, all those. But for me, also, music was not just one-sided. I had to, that time, it was reggae, and then there was music at home, my father was more jazz. So I was balanced in somehow in my understanding. But African music, really talk about West Africa, is that we didn't have that. Yeah, really. It came later, yeah. It came so when, later. When, when were you exp becoming exposed to those other In Europe, sure. of course, when I started to live in Europe. Okay. I started to, yeah, lot like my first band that opened up for in London was called uh, uh, Kasaf. You know about Kasaf? Yeah, it's a very know. big Caribbean, a Martinique band. And then was Manu Dubango. And the old uh, the guitarist from, from the police, who's this guy? Oh, uh, uh, Summers. Yeah, I was playing with a Trilo Good or this the Indian drum. I For know, me, these are the, like a big shows. I started to see, wow, I get to meet these people. It was amazing with Manu also. First time I met Manu was in yeah. Munich, yeah. Very interesting, very down to earth. Then I started to get exposed with, with West Africa, like Mali, Guinea, Burkina Faso, guys like a, a, a group was called Akandenga. Yeah, 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 Akandengi. Man, this music. That's from Gabon. Yeah, this music for me. For me, African music, then it start to get bigger here in Cameroon. There's a lot of bass player for me. The music start to get big the world. Yeah. In Togo, I, I stay with it. My first bass I got from the old man from, 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 from Togo. Very good bass player from Togo. And for me, it was like so surprised how they play this bagaga in different way, but they uh, call it high life, they have, they have this, but it was in Pakistan. No, I think Africa, since we come all from Central Africa, when we broke up there, we all went with the elements, but we changed it where we are, yeah. even in Madagascar. When you listen to Madagascar, you listen to Zimbabwe, it's the same music, and Cameroon, a friend of mine from Cameroon, when he asked Chumurengi, was like, yo, this music, it sounds like what we do in Cameroon traditional. How this is a coincidence? Yeah. It's not. This is because we all come from that Central Africa. So the music, it took a different direction, but it's still the same. We had the same kind of lots of similarities. Uh, what is the most difficult aspect of being a musician? First, the, 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 the difficult for me is also is to work hard to get into a certain level that you feel yourself, you have freedom to express in all style of music, not just one style of music. Yeah. For me, this is the most difficult thing because the more you grow now, you start to see there is a way that you get into a certain level that if you hear any music, you can be able to play and express yourself. This, for me, is the biggest challenge, not to be good in one style. Okay, but what aspect of the music industry is the most difficult. Well, sometimes if you play the real music, it becomes difficult. But if you play bubblegum music, your life becomes very easy. You can make <laughs> okay. fast money, you understand? <laughs> Look, so it's just the pens. You as a musician, what you want to be, or what is you want people to, to, to remember you as. It's like leaving a mark. How has your upbringing or your culture influenced the music you make? I have two balances in life also, because when you talk about culture, also there's a stereotype thing that, you know, but myself, I feel 
I, I have two balanced cultures that myself now I have traveled. I have seen the different side of the world. So I'm not too close to cultural person. I'm more open into everything yeah. and tolerate everybody as the way they are. That's something that I learn by traveling. But if I never travel, I would be still stereotype and be close as yeah. people who've been here inside, you see, and then live by the culture and everything. Because sometimes culturally, it can block a lot of other things. I, I believe it's better to be just a universe person. That's the way I see life. And the way I grew up, my mother also never really brought us out with hate, whatever happened instead of with the apartheid. It just told us to love the people who love you. You know, yeah. because up, coming from the township, a lot of people that have a lot of anger, look, in the, their past. So some, they don't release this past. So yeah. I live with this distance with different people, blah, blah, blah. Now we have xenophobia every now and then. You know, things like yeah. that. And for me, this traveling Africa, it opened up also for me, the South African, to be just a, a African and live yeah, life with yeah. other people and not say you come from, you know, that mentality is not in me anymore, <laughs> See, you know, beside yeah. whatever. But as Rasta people also, we promote one love and, and unity yeah. to everybody. Also imported music that also bring us together. The more you travel, you start to learn different music, it changes your mindset. So you, do you think that Rastafarianism made you more open to... A to lot other, of things. Rasta cultures. made me to, to, be, to, to be just a person, not to be a Cossa band, you know, but it made me to, to be associated with everybody. Yeah. Rasta, yeah. for me, it was a good thing. If I grew up with the mindset that I had, I would be hating all the, yeah, you know, yeah, all the state yeah. look. Like my time, I started to break that stereotype because in the country it was that time that they are you playing in town you with white people, you know, things like that. Yeah. For, for me, this, I tried to break this because for me, I didn't see no color. It was a one language yeah. in whatever we do. So that also changed me as a guy come from the township. We became balanced when we work together and do yeah. things together. I remember there was this one little boy in the 80s. It was a white boy. Teach used to come to the town in those dangerous times. But this boy with his belief, nobody ever harm him. Even soldiers used to stop him when they see him walking there, coming to us, because we were Rasta people. This boy was a young boy. Did he turn out to be a musician? Or? I don't know what happened to him. I was still thinking, okay. but he used to come. You know, and every time with school uniform, white boy, he <laughs> little boy. This was very far, but he had this belief that his, his people, they won't yeah. harm me. Yeah. What aspect of your, of being a musician or your professional life has given you the most satisfaction? Traveling, seeing the world, meeting different people, and start to see also grass is not green on the other side. So for me, it totally, it, it brought a lot of joy in my life and yeah. also understanding people from everywhere. What aspect of music gives yeah. you the most pleasure? For me, it's African music. Now, when I started to discover the West African bass playing style, for me, it's the big thing. Oh, really? Yeah, for me, at the moment, at the moment, I have this guy here also teaching me some stuff when he's here for four years. So, we have a big joy. Me, I met him. I used to listen to him before I met him. It's so funny from a long time. First time I met him, it was listening to him until I met him. And who is, what's his name? It's Andre Nguaga. Nguaga. Nguaga, yeah. Very killer bass player I've ever seen. From, from where? From Cameroon. But also in my life, look, I always wanted to go to Cameroon. I must tell you. Yeah. This was something about Cameroon for me. I always wanted to get this college to get the style that they guys were playing. You know, for me it was very big interest. So funny, it's like God I saw my friend, I meet this guy, then we become very good friend. He's a top, he's level his lap. But he became very simple with me and became a good friend. To play songs with the bass, he used to play, say, fuck, how you know this music? Blah, 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 this is amazing. You, you only guy can copy the style I play. 
Then we started making friends like this. I said to me, I listened to you a long time. This music, I was always wondering who was this bass player yeah. with Rene Salem, this African project I'm talking about. You started with reggae regulars? Yes, yes. I started with reggae regulars yeah, in the 80s. Then I started to coming into town, playing in the bass, sing like other bands, the rock bands like Timpa, you know. They have the Dragons, Ashley and them and, and, and uh, Josh Oaks. They had the usuals, they had the bright blue. For me, it was another world now, getting in. For me, from reggae to other music, I start to love music, basically. No yeah. genres. Now I started to get in by coming into town, listening to different bands. And that also made me to see that this also can be a career. Then I started to get serious a little bit, working. I didn't really get to, to, to music school. I learned a lot by listening and copying stuff. Yeah. And then it was a Praspens and Bart, you know, the bass player. I used to go to him a little bit. Hey, bit so I he used to stay not far from my area. So I used to go for him for a little bit, but I never really go to get a formal school. Yeah. Everything I worked out is more from listening and copying. Old school. Yeah, old school. <laughs> <laughs> so then when did Makweru happen? Well, when we come early 90s, when Makweru started, and he started Makweru with this space dance, a theater thing, dance thing. So Makweru came out of, you yes. met the musicians the in Pace Dance. In, yeah. in Pace dance. Pace dance yeah. Okay. And, but Makweru lasted a long time. Makweru lasted a long time because we, when we went with, uh, with Val Stein and the Pace Dance to first time to go to Europe, that's where when the, the tour finished, basically it was like a one month, we decided to stay. The whole thing started there. For okay. us living in Europe now to sing, okay, we can make it. was three. It was three, it was the bass, drum, and guitar. That's it. And then we worked later, we met this guy from, from, from Mozambique. He used to play with bands from Zimbabwe, like Ilanga, all those only from Tukuzu. But he came with this lady in, 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 in London, Vigilio, he was playing the keyboard. So we started to work with this guy. Then there was a good guitar player we made from Mozambique who came from uh, Nyaman, where Jimmy used to come from. He's a good friend. But he lived in Germany for a long time. Yeah. Very good guitarist. So the band started to grow. The thing is I did it in Germany. I started to work with the old Jamaican guys coming in. Because in Berlin was like the main city, they all passed through in Germany. Guys like uh, Uroy, if you know oh, the yeah. old daddy Uroy. There's a, a big youth, all the old school guys started one guy, Tap Poetry, Okonora. So the guys in Germany, they knew that I did play reggae. So some guys used to call me when they get an artist, so they collect musicians together. Yeah. And then, we, yeah, the mix squad was called the mix squad. <laughs> this, this thing. So they used to call me out of Makweru and come and play with these guys. Okay, then, then from Makweru. What was the next project? Was that the Reggae Jazz project? The Reggae Jazz project, which is I'm still working on it now. It's much even developing that much better because I have a link with the, the old man uh, uh, who's this Ernest Wrangling. Remember the Jamaican guitar? Yeah, yeah, Wrangling, yeah. Yeah, we have something that we want to exchange. And John Kapai, very beautiful guitar yeah. player, yeah. yeah. And John Kapai. So my life of, of reggae into jazz also. It started down to, to, to as a solo thing. Okay, so, so would you see it? You had reggae regulars, Sons of Selassie, yes, yes. Makweru, Makweru yes. reggae jazz project, yes. and then? And then I'm with Azania now. Azania band? Yeah, this is the band that we do a lot of Jamaican work, that we work with the French guys. We, 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 we sign with the French guys. And who's in that band? It's me. My brother was there, my big brother, but he's no longer there, but then my friend. Then we have Luma Umanyano. This boy come up to UCD, but he's in, he's in Berkeley now, in music school. Oh. He's also very good history because this guy came from nothing. His father had nothing, but he used to come and watch us. But now he went to UCD, he's a top student on jazz and reggae. He's, he's Lumanyano Z. Also, he's part of the township. You see people from nowhere getting somewhere, but they focus. His father is a Rasta guy. He's an old user. He has a small shop there. 
He used to also even the way he took the drum thing is very fun because father had a band, but the band was all drama. Sometimes the drama don't come. And then the father one day he said, he said, him, you sit there in the drums. I will show you what to do. And then for him, it was a big moment. Also, start from there, and then he really loved the drums, and then he go to this level yeah. from nothing. Music is everything. Also in life, can make you a person. Also, yeah. when you're thinking in everything, music is totally. Yeah, it's the biggest thing, the spiritual. Once you get deep into it also, it's not like when you've been a small level of music, but when you get deep into music, yeah. it changes you also. It gives you a different way of seeing things. What are the current greatest challenges facing musicians? Well, if you can't play music as a musician, it kills you. Yeah. Because your life is music. And music is life. So if people cut you off, it's like as a musician, you totally, it's a big frustration. You go to, to do some kind of cycle in life. But other way, with me, what happened? It gave me a lot of to be myself and work my stuff. Look, yeah. a lot of times that we were in, there's a lot of stuff that I put in and just learning yeah. and be with myself also. So for me, someone it was, it was good because I recover a lot of things musically with that time of not playing, yeah. but just being Me not playing gigs. Yeah, yeah, being not playing gigs. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way, but it, it, it suffered because you didn't have money. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. you don't have no, no you know, yeah. things like that. So, are you optimistic about the future for music in this country? Well, I think in this country it's going to be tougher uh, unless the arts and culture have some kind of plan how to maintain musicians also. Yeah. But so far, if they don't have plan, I think to be outside for me would be better because there's better opportunities to work outside, look, and move in. You get better exchange money and things like that. I'm not really looking at here to survive. I'm looking outside. Yeah. The more work I get outside is better for me when I come back. Yeah. So working now with the French guys, for me it looks, it looks good because we seem to be getting work more outside than inside. Mm. But thanks, man. I think th this is a very beautiful interview. Thank and you. thank you very much for... Thank you for, very much. Thank you for agreeing I to I thank this, you man. for remembering me from all this time. It's so good. It's so funny that I had too much different friends, like, you know, different people. It's good that people still remember you from yeah. the time. You know, we don't really forget that time. And that time, it means a lot to us now in this age. That yeah. we still have this connection. Yeah. You know, we have this respect for each other. It's very important.